This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Hide.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first-class VPN. Go to Hide.me slash Epicenter and sign up for a free account today. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Kuchu. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with Eric Voorhees. Eric Voorhees, probably most people have heard of, and uh, he's, of course, the founder of Shapeshift, who longtime podcast listeners will know very well because they were a long time and one of the first sponsors of the show. And he's been well known in the in the industry for being involved in Bitcoin very early on, being a sort of a very a great advocate for Bitcoin and uh, and also for libertarianism and, and sort of Bitcoin and libertarianism. So. Thanks so much for joining us, Eric. Thanks for having me on the show today. It's sort of coincidental that like you're on like right now, because I think we invited you uh, before, but then there's all this news around Shapeshift. Uh, and, and so recently you've been uh, yeah, a, a, big, a big story around uh, you guys getting hacked. Can you talk a little bit about what happened there? Yeah. Um, so about... So about a week and a half or two weeks ago, we, we put out um, basically the, all the details of, of what happened. And I wrote up a like 15 page um, piece about um, the whole the whole story from start to finish, because it's quite a... which, which by, I mean, it was a great story, by the way. And uh, I am not one to read really long blog posts, but I read this one and was just I couldn't stop reading it. It was really fascinating the way you it, it reads like um, it reads like uh, some kind of novel, you know. <laughs> Yeah, well, I when I when I sat down and decided to write about what happened, I, I thought it might be like four or five pages, and um, I got through four or five pages just you know <laughs> talking about the first incident. So um, basically, what happened, um, we brought on a guy uh, to be our our head sys admin, basically our head of security, our, our server DevOps person, uh, because we knew that as we were growing, we needed both you know, to, to start scaling larger and also to be more secure because we're handling cryptocurrency. Um, and so that was all fine. Uh, but about a little, a month and a half ago in, in middle of March, March 14th, um, we, we wake up and discover that 315 Bitcoin had been stolen from our hot wallet. Um, and it's important to mention that None of the funds that were lost were customer money because we don't hold any customer money, but it was it was our money, and that's still a lot of funds. Um, so we we started investigating right away. We were we were pretty upset and confused about what had happened, and um, within a couple hours, we realized that it was actually stolen by uh, an employee, and the very employee who we had hired to to set up all the servers safely and be our our sysadmin. So um, we, <laughs> there were a number of, of smoking guns, but the, uh, the biggest one was that while we were, uh, while we were in the office uh, trying to figure everything out, investigating, uh, we see in the logs, he deleted uh, the keys that had accessed the server uh, where the coins were restored that morning. So while we're all sitting there, he's, he's deleting keys um, and then uh, he he left during sort of the middle of the afternoon. Uh, said he got a call from his mother to take her to the hospital, and uh, he had to leave. We we had been getting very suspicious by that point, and so we didn't try to stop him because we kind of wanted to start working without him near us. And uh, as soon as he left, you know, I, I was told about what we'd seen in the logs. Um, so basically, we never saw him again, and we knew that that he did it, and the the Bitcoin hadn't left. Uh, the address that he stole it to, uh, it's still there. Uh, the address is shown in the blog post so people can go see. But um, the bitcoins are still there today. Yep. Yeah, we we have a quite a few notifications set up if funds ever move from that address. So uh, we since we since we caught him so quickly, we knew where he was. We had a lot of his personal information, and the funds hadn't moved. We we thought, okay, fine, we'll we'll proceed with a with a case against him we'll get the funds back one way or another um, but basically it's it's fine and case closed um, but then about 
that we were working on brand new infrastructure because we assumed that the stuff he had been working on for us was was largely compromised. So we had to divert, you know, lots of our resources into rebuilding things. And a, a couple of weeks later, as we're getting ready to launch that new infrastructure, um, the hot wallets in that new infrastructure got Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Ethereum stolen from them. And this was April 7th. It was a Thursday. Um, so again, just like a terrible feeling of dread and panic and, and what the hell happened. Obviously, this former employee wasn't with us. Uh, we, we saw no immediate evidence that he was involved, although, of course, he was on the top of our concern list. Um, uh, but we, we tracked some of the uh, some of the coins that were stolen to an exchange. We got information about the account holder at that exchange. This is one part of the story where uh, I, I thought was sort of interesting. So you, you contacted this, this exchange and they just handed over the, the information of the account uh, uh, in they question? Don't, they don't just hand over information, but if you show a direct link of your coins leaving your hot wallet and going into a wallet that they control, um, and they know who you are and they trust you, then then yeah, it's not just going to proceed un, unimpeded. So a lot of the exchanges work with each other um, on these theft cases, and uh, sometimes they can find out quite a bit of information. So we got uh, we got basically the the account details of this guy. His name was Roviond, and we assumed it was all fake information. But there was an email there, and I contacted the email, and I I said. Nice job on the hack. How'd you do it? Basically just trying to see if he would, you know, want to boast and give some details on what he had done. Um, and uh, the next day uh, we had taken the site down. We we're trying to figure out what had happened and, and rebuild again in a wholly new infrastructure once again. And it was just a horrible, like panic mode situation. Um, and we get, I get an email back the next day from the guy. Um, and to my question, how he did it, he, he responded with the email saying just, uh, quote unquote, one word, Bob. And Bob is the pseudonym we're, we're giving to the, uh, to the former employee. So, uh, when we got that email, it was just one of those like, holy shit moments. And at first you're like, okay, does that mean that, that the hacker is, is Bob? But that didn't seem likely because that would mean just he's implicating himself in the prior hack even further. So then we we started realizing that like what it probably meant was that Bob had sold our uh, information or given it away online to some hacker who had used that to infiltrate and get in and, and carry out another hack. So um, I tried to, to chat with him um, and just get some more details. Uh, in the meantime, you know, the, the next day we got the site back up on wholly new infrastructure with with brand new keys and like should have been as safe as can be. And this would have been Saturday, April 9th. And then uh, that morning, we're hacked again, and more Bitcoin and Ethereum stolen from the hot wallet on this new infrastructure. And this was boggling our minds because we, we were not we were not sharing any any keys. These were fresh wallets created on the new servers, there should not have been any, any way for these this to happen. So just just to to sort of explain, like you're you're building this new infrastructure. Of course, all your employees uh, have. I mean, maybe not all your employees, but some of your employees, strategic ones, have SSH keys to to get onto this infrastructure. I mean, we're not talking about you know uh, Bitcoin wallet private keys here. We're talking about SSH keys to right. uh, to connect to your servers. Yeah, but new and new if you generate keys. these new yeah. keys. Yeah, I mean, you're generating new wallet keys, but if you're generating new keys, what what's where, where you're being confused is like, how is he getting these new keys if right. Bob's no longer here, and how is he accessing the server that we're only we're the only ones that we're supposed to have access to? Exactly. Um, it was very confusing, and um, so immediately I I decided to to bring in the big guns. I, I called Michael Perklin at uh, at Ledger Labs. They're a, a blockchain forensics company, and um, Michael's fantastic. I, I highly recommend him. Um, he uh, he flew out right away, and we started investigating. Um, the site was down for for several days, um, about ten days total after it was all said and done. Um, but during during all the investigation, we found a number of things. We found uh, that the guy had deleted a bunch of logs. 
uh, we actually recovered a bunch of the logs in empty disk space, which was just uh, pure luck because it, it just meant that the bits hadn't been overwritten. Um, so that was all helpful and we started piecing together a lot of things. We, f we found the malware that had been installed that, that gave a backdoor to, to uh, hack the funds and, and that same malware was found on both the infrastructure on the on April seventh and the infrastructure on April 9th, which was whole wholly new infrastructure. Which so the third hack was used. The third hack was also by Bob, because he had these. Uh, we or you don't know. We know that the first hack was by Bob, and then the second hack, the hacker said that Bob was responsible, um, and the sec and the third hack was also done by uh, the the second hacker. So there basically there are two people that are relevant. Bob, who was the employee in the first hack, and then Rovion, who was the hacker on April 7th and the same hacker on April 9th. And he, he sent me a smiley face email like two minutes after the, the hack on the 9th, um, just being a dick. But uh, so anyway, I ended up having some chats with Rovion. Um, he he popped, popped into our public Slack um, and we, we talked uh, just over chat. Uh, the first chat was was light on details, but it gave us. He, he basically said that he had bought um, information about how to to break in from Bob, so that confirmed. Wait, his... wait, was he was like was he like on the Republic like Slack channels or just no, it, talking? He came into with our you? public Slack channel, but it was a PM between him and me. Okay. In in the Slack. So are you able to a Slack able to help? I like, or was he using some like Tor or something like that or? Um, you don't know. We're pursuing all leads, so I won't get into that further. Yeah. But um, okay. Wow. Ro unlike unlike Bob <laughs> Rovion, Bob was Bob made a lot of really stupid mistakes. Rovion seemed to be a little more sophisticated. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if he was fairly well hidden. Uh, we still know some things about him now, and we're we're finding out more. But um, basically, the, the first chat with him was was light on details. The second chat with him was because he came back to me on like the Wednesday following the second hack or the third hack. And he asked if he could exchange the Ethereum that he had stolen for Bitcoin because we were tracking some of the Ethereum and it had gotten frozen at several accounts. So he had been trying to convert his Ethereum into, into Bitcoin. It was getting stuck at the exchanges and frozen. So he comes back to me and asks if I will exchange the Ethereum that he took for, for Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I feel like I mean you have to be <laughs> fairly well connected with exchanges like th 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 is it like some exchange mailing list where you just like send an email and all the exchanges like they have this the, I mean, it's you know, more, they, they have the it's addresses more personal, or, it's more personal yeah. than that I mean obviously I know a lot of the exchange uh, operators well, personally yeah, obviously, yeah. Um, and they all have an interest in stopping you know legitimate crime and fraud and theft um, and some of them really like kind of diving into these investigations and, and trying to find these people because these thieves like have have really poisoned the entire industry uh, continually. It's like a constant problem. And um, you know, for those for those who don't tend to rely on government uh, quote unquote services to to help stop these things because they generally don't, what that requires is that industry participants step up. And, uh, and figure it out themselves. So there's a lot of that that goes on. He gets back to you and, and now offers, yeah. uh, or pr proposes that you, you you buy back this Ethereum for him. Yeah, uh, at market rate. So we wouldn't lose any value from it. We'd just be converting one coin for another, which ironically is what we do for, for business. Um, so I was like, well, okay, but you need to tell us a lot more details about how this all happened. And, uh, and he did so. And basically in that conversation, he revealed... Um, that he got, uh, he was sold SSH keys. He was sold um, IP addresses of servers. He was sold IP addresses of, of the LAN, um, passwords to routers, at, on the local network, and uh, most importantly, um, Bob had installed like a, not backdoor is not the right word, but a, like a remote like access, a, Trojan. A, a remote access terminal. Um, on on one or more of of our employees' computers, while like, a, like a VNC or something like that, remote yeah. desktop, yeah, remote okay. desktop thing, right? Um, while he was here, so so 
which means that when he stole the money on March 14th, it wasn't just a quick, like opportunistic, oh, there's some funds, I'm going to take it. He, he basically set up a whole bunch of, um, of, of malicious, you know, software in the network and then used and then stole the funds and then used all that malicious stuff to sell and get more money from other, from other people. So, so he, 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 he had sold, access to our computers. So he sold him, just so we, we can understand maybe how, so he sold him access to, uh, so IPs to your server, IPs to your, your router in your office, mm-hmm. and, ac- and admin access to those routers, and then installed VPN software. So basically the, the guy, the Rovion, he, he uh, gets into your local network, uh, can connect to a VNC, like actually like he's sitting behind a desk uh, at one of your employees' desks looking at the computer and then with those yep. SSH keys can log into, uh, into, the, into the infrastructure. That's, that's really fascinating. And um, so the one thing I didn't quite understand then is at what point did Bob and Rovion like cross paths? Like who was the initiator? Was it Rovion that contacted Bob or was it Bob that sold, that suck, uh, went to seek out Rovion? So what Rovion said, and of course, like he, he's a hacker here and we don't trust him. So we have to take everything he says with a grain of salt. But uh, what he said is that he learned of the, um, of the hack that Bob had done. And he contacted Bob and offered to buy the information. And then Bob obliged and sold it to him. He showed us an email uh, from Bob, basically stating that he had received the funds. And he, in that email was uh, the, the IP addresses and the passwords and stuff that only someone in this office would have known. Um, all that kind of thing. How would, uh, how would Rovion learn about Bob's hack? We're unclear on that. We have a couple of suspicions, but... Um, I, we think we know how, but we haven't given out that detail. Let's take a short break to talk about hide.me. Look, when you're choosing a VPN provider, you want to make sure that your privacy is protected. You know, if a government agency tries to force the VPN provider to hand over some of your traffic or ban or, or browsing information, will they be able to do that? And is your payment information attached to the account? These are all things that you want to consider when choosing a VPN provider. With hide.me, all that's taken care of. For starters, they're based in Malaysia and Malaysian laws don't require them to keep any logs. In fact, hide.me has no logs of your traffic or browsing uh, history. So even if a government agency was trying to force them to hand over some information, they would be straight out of luck because hide.me has nothing to give them. In addition to that, they use a third party party payment provider, uh, which uh, doesn't give them any of your payment information. So they have they have no way to link an account to like a credit card or a PayPal account. So even if you're paying with PayPal or credit card, there's no way for hide.me to know which account paid for what. And of course, if you're paying with Bitcoin, then you're completely transparent. Uh, so what we suggest is if you're creating an account with hide.me, if you want that extra level of privacy, just make a fake Gmail address and use that to sign in. So that way you're completely anonymous. You can give hide.me a try with their free plan. Their free plan includes two gigabytes of data at unthrottled bandwidth. You can use any of their free exit nodes, which are in Amsterdam, in Singapore, and in Montreal. And you can sign up for that at hide.me slash epicenter. Now, if you use our URL, and if you decide to go premium down the line, it's gonna get you 35% off. And the premium plan gives you a lot. It gives you unlimited data. You can use as much as you want. You can connect up to five devices, so your whole household fits on the plan and you can use any of their exit nodes all over the world and they've got like 30 of them. And of course, you can pay with Bitcoin. So give it a try. We would like to thank Kite.me for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So let's say now uh, Rovian bought from Bob this information. Do these people use escrow in any way? Or like, how does that work? Or similarly, <laughs> when you exchange the Bitcoin for the Ether, yeah. like well, was that sort uh... of on trust? It, it's an interesting kind of social problem when two people that don't trust each other are trying to exchange um, and you're trying to you're trying to be quick, like you don't want to set up an escrow account with some third party over time. So when he wanted to convert the Ethereum to Bitcoin, obviously we, we can't just send him a huge chunk of Bitcoin and then expect him to send the Ethereum back to us. So 
essentially what you do is you just break it into little pieces and one person goes first and sends a small mm -hmm. amount and then the other person sends a small amount and you just do that over and over. Um, and it's tedious, but it works. And, you know, interestingly, like there were, there was a period where we, we were sending a bunch of the little pieces of Bitcoin um, and he was sending the Ethereum to us and the Bitcoin wasn't confirming because all the blocks were full. And so there was like a period of just, well, about an hour uh, where blocks had happened and the transactions that, that I had sent to him weren't confirming. And he started getting really suspicious, like that I was trying to double spend him or something. And um, so it, then we had to wait and we just kind of sat there awkwardly for about 20 or 30 minutes until uh, a block finally came along that confirmed those. So <laughs> that was a, and then him and I were joking about the, the block size thing. So that was a little <laughs> and very tense situation. <laughs> so that, 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 it must be so weird to like you must be so angry and upset at this person and you just uh, but uh, on the other hand you're having some sort of really casual conversation with them about how they just stole the like, thousands yeah, I mean, it was, and thousands of it dollars wasn't really, but, it wasn't really casual but there was just a, a brief moment of levity during that period because he he started suspecting me of double spending him and then it all came through fine and it was okay but Obviously, he was an enemy and someone who I, who I detest. But at the same time, he was giving us useful information that that we needed about, you know, the the true villain in this case, which was Bob, which essentially, you know, betrayed us completely. Um, and the the hacker Rovion, he made this this funny statement toward the end that. He, he had he had said after we did our exchange he didn't want to have any more communication and then at the end he said actually I, I know I said that but um, I do want you to tell me uh, when when Bob's been arrested or, or sued or whatever because stealing from your employer is really shitty and so like even the hacker was pretty dismayed about Bob's character and behavior in this whole thing okay and so I mean you've been back up now for a couple of weeks I think. Yeah, two weeks. I think at the end of okay, well, a week, week and a half. So you yeah. went. I, so I, I think I was checking around that time. So you first started with Ethereum, and then you brought on some other coins, and now like you're back up to the fifty or so coins that. Not fifty. We so at, at our max we had like forty five coins. Um, we have about twenty five at this point, so we're adding we're adding them chunk by chunk. Each coin has its own little awkward. Uh, behavioral issues and in the new infrastructure that we set up um we locked it down to such a degree that like every little piece takes a lot of work to to make it connect and operate properly so we're trying to get the coins on as fast as we can but most of the big important ones are back online already and, and how much money did you lose in total uh, including like revenues lost uh from this whole thing being like well, down for 10 so days or whatever the amount that was directly hacked was was probably a little under a quarter million dollars over three hacks. Um, and lost revenues, I mean, at least another at least another fifty thousand. And then um, you know, everything from like uh, reputational damage and lost customers and just um, all that. I don't I don't know how to put a figure on that. But then there's the cost of, of all the security auditing, which is ridiculously expensive um, to do it well and to have good people doing it. Um, and then you know, all the lawyer fees and, and just the opportunity cost of all the engineers uh, being diverted from productive work into scrambling to build secure infrastructure um, in sort of panic mode for, for a period of time. It's um, a, huge, a huge loss in terms of money and, and time and resources and just psychologically it's incredibly difficult and defeating to, to go through multiple hacks like that over time um but the i was very impressed with the team they they totally rallied behind the, the mission and um put in ridiculous hours to make sure that we'd be back up and, and safe and i gotta say i mean i was impressed by the level of support that you got from the community and yeah, that was really and nice. on, on, like on reddit and on your slack and i i i 
barely saw any negative comments or whatever like people just you know just rooting for you to get through it and, and you know like bashing yeah. this hacker and, and I, Bob and that must be really encouraging as well it was very encouraging and I got a lot of really nice uh, emails and calls from people who were just there to offer their support and sympathy and to say that you know they had been through similar things and that they understood how horrible it was so that that was really helpful um but of course, a lot of people really liked how transparent we were being. And so we got a lot of praise for that and a lot of goodwill. Absolutely. Um, but fundamentally, I think the reason that the response was so positive and supportive of us was because no customer money got lost. Um, you know, not a dollar of customer funds was was ever at risk or, or lost in the hack. And I think it showed the community that like an exchange built in a certain way can be hacked in this case three times by an insider, you know, that had like all the information and connection to do whatever he wanted. And still, even in that case, not a single dollar of customer money is lost. And for an industry that has been plagued with this kind of thing since, since the beginning, um, I, I think that was a relief for a lot of people to feel. And, and while I theoretically understood that like that was a great advantage of shapeshift, this made it very real. And uh, I can't imagine having to go through this and also having lost, you know, 10 or 20 or $100 million of customer money. So with, with how the infrastructure is now, do you feel like this could happen again if it's an insider? Because, I mean, this is, a, I guess, it's one thing to protect from the outsider, but when you have an insider, that's such a, a yeah. insidious so it, threat. What happened, um, what happened could not happen again, even if there was an insider. So we've, we've tried to harden it from many angles to, to prevent the same thing from happening again, but also anything else that could possibly be fathomed. And uh, security can never be 100%, and you can spend an infinite sum of money trying to become infinitely secure, which is impossible. Um, but we, <laughs> I'm pretty impressed with what we've built. It's, it's been uh, amazing to see some of the technologies that we've, we've employed to, to make this kind of thing uh, not able to happen again. And it was things that we that we should have done eventually anyway, of course. Yeah, I mean, I, that that's the thing, right? I mean, when, when you're building a, a startup and of, of course, like, you know, you guys have been around for a while, you've, especially around security, a lot of times it feels like, you know, like this is something we have to do, you know, we'll do it at some point. Uh, it's important that we do it, but, you know, then you're caught off guard by something like this. And, you know, obviously it could be, um, you know, this was an extreme case of that happening. Uh, yeah. Of, uh, but um, so it, just to to come back to the infrastructure you built. So I, I I presume that your your hot wallets weren't multi sig. Um, they they weren't, but that wouldn't have prevented what happened. Um, what we've done with them now will pre- prevent it. But a lot of the problem is that like much of the good way to store Bitcoin is done uh, putting in checks and balances so that when funds move, uh, they, they can't move with, without passing all those checks, multi-sig being one check of, of a number that you can use. And often those kind of checks start getting in the way of automation. And so you, you get into the system where you're trying, to, um, you're trying to find the right balance between something that's automated and scalable and can handle lots of you know, customer orders without delaying them because our whole... Um, our whole enterprise is built to make exchange easy and fast for people. So if we clog it all up with a bunch of security checks, that starts defeating the point. But at the same time, you, ha- you can't just let things flow through without watching what it's doing. So it's a very tricky balance and there's not a, it's not a perfect answer. It's just a, a process of learning. So what's your takeaway from this? Like what did you, what's the lesson? A uh, few lessons. One, the most important theme is um, most people understand how dangerous, you know, hackers can be from the outside and that there are, there's this world of hackers out there that'll get you if they can. Um, and so people try to protect themselves from the, the outside and they often do a, a pretty decent job of that. But the threat from inside, the threat from an internal employee, someone who's close through um, social engineering or, or anything in that realm. Uh, has to be understood as as an equal threat, um, just just as powerful and dangerous. And while most people put a lot of effort into protecting from the outside, they they put minimal efforts into protecting from the inside. And that that was the most important lesson that we learned is to treat the two those two realms as as equal threats, because you can hire a hundred people and ninety nine percent of them can be angels, 
but one person can can totally screw it up for everything and, and it's impossible to it's impossible to know the character and, t- and intentions of everyone all the time yeah cool and so maybe one last question on this is there any kind of takeaway about how you would deal with that threat in the future because it's i mean it's one thing to understand that it's another thing to do something about it and prevent it from having an impact on the business right yeah well the uh the the lowest hanging fruit is is uh making sure the computers are always locked when you're not next to it so what we think happened in our case is that like um bob found computers at the office that were open and installed things on them um and how he did it may have been pretty sneaky because again he was our our sysadmin guy right so when your sysadmin guy like says he needs to do something, uh, you, you're usually inclined to trust him. But I, I think in this case, he actually just went to open computers and installed things. And that's, that's like if you go to the if you go to the bathroom during the day, um, just turn your your screen off and make sure it's locked. Like it's it's super easy. It takes two seconds to do, um, and it can in this in this case we think it would have prevented um, all all or or at least the latter two of the hacks. And, um, you know, after I read that, that blog post, like immediately the next day I went, I went to the office and I, I told my co-founders, like, you know, we need to do a security audit. We're about to launch in beta where, uh, you know, of course we don't hold any funds except for maybe like, you know, a little, a little bit of funds for, for Bitcoin transactions, but, uh, cause we, you know, we do a completely different type of thing, but, uh, but regardless of that, uh, in this industry, it feels that you, you know, you can you know, it, it's pretty easy for people to have a grudge on you, uh, and to be sort of on, yeah. Um, so, w- w- for 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 a startup that you know, perhaps doesn't have a whole lot of funding and and um, you know doesn't have like a hundred thousand dollars to put in to to invest in a security audit with like Ledger Labs, for instance, uh, what what kind of things do you suggest that are really important that they do except for just locking computers <laughs> yeah well for, for the record or, or is it or, or is it worth that investment like is it, you know should you the, put the money for the record it didn't cost quite that much with them but it was pretty expensive anyway um i mean it, it's often just proportional and one of our one of our mistakes was that like when shapeshift got started um you know i sort of had in my mind that like our security doesn't really matter much at all because we're only holding you know, 10K in, in cryptocurrencies in these various hot wallets. And that was probably a true statement back then when we were getting started. But uh, growth growth happens, and it's kind of like the the frog in the boiling pot situation. And before we knew it, we're not we're not storing 10K. We're storing, you know, a few hundred K of, of still our funds, not customer money, but still, a, you know, at that point, we needed to we needed to see that that had happened um, and reassessed our security and, and taken steps before this hack to to make that more secure. So that was that was wholly my my mistake. It doesn't mean that a, a startup should spend a hundred grand on on security right when they're getting started. Um, that's that's probably a bad business decision. But it does mean that there's probably a point at which you need to spend that much to to do it. And um, you know, if we had done that before, it, it sounds expensive, but it would have saved us. A lot of money in this case. Today's magic word is Bob. B O B. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. Where do you see the company and, and, and kind of the ecosystem, let's say five years from now? What's Shapeshift going to look like? So Shapeshift will look very similar uh, in that it's always and forever going to be an exchange for digital assets, an engine to convert between any blockchain asset to any other. Um, and so as the world of blockchain assets becomes richer and more intricate, Shapeshift will have more and more roles to fill for various parties. But um, I think the the rise of Ethereum has has shown that it's unlikely that we're going to live in a world with just one blockchain asset you know, being Bitcoin. And that was, that was my hunch when I got it started was that um, Bitcoin may forever be the, 
the, the biggest cryptocurrency used or the biggest, most important blockchain. But um, these software systems are, are so intricate enough that, that they will have uses for different things. And in each, each blockchain is not going to be appropriate for every other application. The Bitcoin blockchain is not appropriate for every application. Um, and so that, that means there will be lots of these tokens. And we're seeing lots of new tokens be built on top of Ethereum now. So we have like the, the Digix gold token that was just released. We have the Augur reputation token that's coming out. And um, all these things are built not to be competing monies with Bitcoin, but they are valuable blockchain tokens. And so uh, Shapeshift is here to, to help this industry be able to convert any of those tokens into any other one without any friction whatsoever. So that brings up an interesting topic, right? Ethereum. So when you have assets that, that are running like on top of the blockchain, let's say you want to trade um, some Ethereum asset for Ether or for a different Ethereum asset, does Shapeshift still have a role in that? And, and is that a different role than from, for example, just trading Bitcoin for Ether? Um, we, we're pretty agnostic when it comes to which tokens there are and, and how they're constructed. Um, we just we just know that there will always need to be a way to convert between them easily. And because they are assets that have um, monetary value, it means there are lots of issues surrounding uh, liquidity and exchange. Um, and you know that that's the kind of thing that can't necessarily just be programmed. Um, so shapeshift is is in many ways a, a service for the exchange of those things. So you mean if you have, because uh, it, it would be possible to do, let's say, for example, a decentralized exchange with, you know, let's say some Ethereum token in Ether, but then the issue might be you may not have liquidity there. So it might still be better to use Shapeshift that leverages some other exchange. Or, yeah, I mean, um, and I'm a fan of, of decentralized exchanges. I'm glad to see them growing. Um, we, we also will use them because we plug into every exchange. So the more exchanges out there in the world, uh, the, the better our, our pricing becomes and the more liquid we become as well. Um, but a lot, of those, um, a lot of those trustless decentralized exchanges have sort of a capital cost, which is that you have to put up escrow funds in order to hold balances or, or trade with people. Um, and so that, that means that they're in, in one dimension, it is less efficient to trade that way uh, because you're putting up sometimes double the capital per, per trade that you need to do. Um, and when you're talking about a small order, that, that's not a big deal. But when you're talking about like industrial size financial operations, that starts to become a little unrealistic. So, um, so Shapeshift, you know, tries to provide the fastest and easiest way and probably the, the most um, capital efficient way as well. Okay, that's in, that's very interesting. Uh, it, it, with with decentralized exchanges, do you think that those problems are going to be solved, or do you think they will always have these kind of disadvantages opposed to centralized exchanges? I'm not sure. I th I think as with many things in this industry, decentralization is a, a really important goal and a fundamental principle of of what everyone's building. But not everything should always be decentralized all the time. It it, it ha decentralization comes with a certain set of uh, features and costs to it, um, which are often great and solve certain problems, but sometimes cause cause others. And I think that the blockchain world is going to be nuanced enough that that there are going to be different types of services for different people. Just as just as the inter in the internet industry doesn't have just one company, you know that that runs everything. Um, there's a lot of different use cases for different things, and so it'll be a, a healthy ecosystem. And a lot of these tools help each other out. So, you know, as, as I was saying, other exchanges provide us liquidity and they, they help make us better. Um, I think the fact that Ethereum exists is good for Bitcoin. I think it makes Bitcoin stronger and I think Bitcoin makes Ethereum stronger. And people are too quick to jump to, to seeing all these things as com competitors and there can only be one. But in reality, um, the ecosystem, I think, will be very, very rich and dynamic. So another question that kind of goes into the, you know, a little bit further future, right? So now we have Ethereum and, and all kinds of smart contract chains, right? So interactions between different blockchains might start to look a little bit different than simply moving uh, a token around. And you may have more complex type of interactions or contracts interacting with each other. 
are, are you thinking about the impact that will have on Shapeshift and if, whether Shapeshift will also be able to play a role in there? Yeah, um, sort of in the same way that we're coin agnostic, we're, we're also technology agnostic. So um, the way that this whole industry evolves into the future, I think is, is going to be unpredictable. There's no way to figure it all out today. Uh, so part, you know, part of what we're building is a, is a brand that people know, like if I need to change one asset into another easily, Shapeshift's the way to do it. The specific technology that Shapeshift's using today is probably not the, the same that it's going to be using in five years. Uh, and, and that's fine. It doesn't matter to a user. Um, that's all things that our, our company has to work on to always stay competitive and always be building things that are, that are fundamentally useful to people. Um, in, in that, in that vein, we have a cool new exchange that we're building right now, which isn't, isn't known about yet, but which, uh, people will see later this year. And I, I think it'll demonstrate that principle. Can you talk about your product roadmap or what, what extent are you willing to talk about some of the things that, uh, that you're working on or that have, have in the pipe for, um, I don't want to, I don't want to discuss it publicly without, you know, getting the, the pass from our, uh, our team, but, uh, suffice to say there are, there's certain ways of trading that are needed for large scale, um, operators and people who care a lot about price. And so we're building a tool to allow that without, uh, without leaving our principles of, of non-custody. Um, so I know that's a vague answer and not helpful, but, uh, we'll, uh, we'll let you guys know as soon as we're ready to talk about it. Yeah, I think that was the definition of a vague answer. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Yeah. <laughs> At least I acknowledge it, though. Uh, yeah, no, but so, but one thing you, you mentioned, which I, th I thought was you know right on, is is that uh, you know, in terms of branding, I think that you guys have been extremely successful at just really building that brand of the like, shapeshift is the one place where you can really simply and easily convert your coins from one to the other. And I mean, uh, you know, we we've said this many times on this show as. <laughs> as a as a, a past sponsor uh and um and so you know you know really like good good job on, uh, for 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 building that trust and not only the branding but also being built sort of building trust in the ecosystem it's, it's not easy um mm -hmm. and i think you're one of the companies in the bitcoin space that really stands out uh in this regard yeah ho hopefully a, a lot of that just comes from like the the customer service angle this is another one of those things that like a, a decentralized exchange is always going to have problems with because to grow, you need to bring on new people. And that necessarily means people who have not used the system before, who are not experts, who have not read white papers on how things work. And those people often need to have their hands held to, to one degree or another. Um, and w one of the principles that I think is really important for this industry is to understand is that it will only grow to the extent that we make crypto stuff easy for people. Um, and that means, you know, being able to chat with them and walk them through these, these tools that they're learning, uh, this technology and these processes won't be ubiquitous for the next, you know, for the next 10 years. And that means there's going to be a lot of work that has to be done just to, just to help people walk through it. And so regarding the, the product right now, like I'm on your website, so you've got a couple of tools, uh, maybe focus on those for I mean, a lot of our listeners will know about like the lens extension, the shifty button, the skeleton plugin, and all that stuff. Um, uh, specifically regarding the API, what are the most common use cases that people are using the API? Uh, except for like the obvious one, which is having a shape shift button on your in your in your you know wallet that you know allows you to really easily um, exchange coins from one to another. Um, I think that as uh... As, as the world of, as the multi-token world proceeds, uh, lots of wallets and services will just by their nature support many tokens. Um, and for any customer that is using that service, they should be able to just snap their finger and, and turn one into the other. Um, they, sh they should not have to withdraw one, send it to an exchange, sign up with that exchange account, wait for the deposit to clear, putting in an ask a bid order, wait for it to be withdrawn and then send it back to where they came from. Uh, that's, that's a horrible user experience. And so everything that has digital asset tokens in the future should allow immediate conversion without friction between them. That, that should be sort of a, a principle of the industry that all these things are uh, immediately liquid into each other. 
And so to do that, you can you can plug in the, the Shapeshift API and have that ready to go immediately. That's what we're building. And so, yeah, that, that, that makes me think of something. So one of the use cases that often gets thrown around in, in the blockchain space is fidelity points. And when, you know, one, one, one way in which blockchains can help sort of um, optimize the way fidelity point systems are built is by providing more transparency, et cetera. But one of the things that people keep touting, and, and I don't know if this is actually ever going to come to fruition, is creating a liquid market for fidelity points where you, know, you can trade one type of fidelity point for another. Not sure if there's any incentive for brands to do that. Um, do you see that as one potential use case for Shapeshift where like brands and companies start issuing their asset? And uh, yeah, like where do you see that going generally? Yeah, we... And we've um, we've played around with this idea before. I, I think um, another another way that can look is is with like access keys to an exclusive group. So so Shapeshift has some number of users. I mean, I guess we don't even know how many users we have by our by our nature. But um, let's say we want to create a suite of special features and um, release ten thousand keys for for those special features. Uh, Normally, you would sell those like as licenses to single people, but then those people are, are stuck with them. And when they buy it, they're like, okay, if I buy this $100 thing, I'm spending $100 and I, I won't ever get that back. So is it worth $100? If you tokenize it all and, and make it liquid, then if you buy the $100 access key, you know that it will have a resale value and a very easy liquid resale value. You don't have to like post them on Craigslist and hope someone in your area will buy it for 30% of its value. You'll know that it. You'll be always be able to check the price, and you may well be able to sell it for more than you bought it for if the if the service is growing. So it, it offers a whole new way for people to um, engage with a company who and and a way to sell information um, that is both better for the the company because they can bring in revenue, but also better for the buyer of that information because when they're done needing that information, they can sell the rights onward to someone else in a very easy liquid way. I think that is going to be a, a huge use case of blockchain assets, but no one's doing it yet. So you've been involved in, in the cryptocurrency space for a long time, and you're also quite experienced as an entrepreneur, you know, having started a whole bunch of projects. Now, if you, if you were to start something today, or, or what, what area would you look at? Um, there's a couple of ideas that I won't mention because I, I may invest in them elsewhere, but... Um, Someone still needs to build a way to uh, go long or short any cryptocurrency immediately by just depositing Bitcoin. So uh, basically a, a website where you, if you have 10 Bitcoin, you can deposit that with that company and then go long or short any, any crypto asset um, that you want. Something very easy with an easy user interface um, so that just just by because there's there's so much uh, there's so much hatred and anger for a lot of these altcoins, um, people throwing out, you know, insults on Reddit forums about a certain asset, they should be able to short that asset. Uh, they, I'm, I'm a big fan of putting your money where your mouth is. And if you make a service that's easy enough for people to do that, then you don't need to argue about which assets are valuable and which are frauds. If you know that a, if a certain asset is a scam, you go short the hell out of it and you'll make a bunch of money doing so. And th that both brings honesty to the industry and, and also I think would be a, just a really cool demonstration of the flexibility of, of Bitcoin. So if I wasn't doing Shapeshift right now, that's one idea that I might pursue and, and someone needs to do it. Wouldn't that be something that would be natural for you guys to build as well since you already have all the connections with the exchanges and, and you offer something that's somewhat similar yeah i mean don't don't think we haven't thought about building it but we have a list of like <laughs> 20 20 big projects that we want to work on so uh i don't i don't mind sharing that one with the community and, and it may well be something that someone can build and then use shapeshift for the back end uh to to acquire or, or sell assets easily and and what else is are there some other areas where you feel like there's a lot of really exciting innovation happening and a lot of opportunities sort of in the blockchain space? Um, yeah, another area that's really that's going to take off, but is mostly stymied, I think, by U.S. regulation, is in um, 
I don't know if there's a good term for it yet, but but imagine like a, a new artist, a new songwriter who has their their fans, right? And those fans are super dedicated and the fans know that this artist is going to be big in the future. But the artist doesn't want to sign up with a big record label and, and go through all that stuff. Um, there should be a way that that fans of a small project can buy, for lack of a better word, equity in the future success of that project. So let's imagine Taylor Swift is just getting started and she releases 10,000 Taylor Swift tokens in her early days to her fans um, and then promises that like future revenue from her from her work will be paid out to those tokens, um, very much like investing in a business. That that would be huge because people who, who know the artist is really good would love to both support them financially, but also then uh, reap the rewards if they're if they're right about that. And uh, I this this idea came to me because my my wife Michelle she's always she always knows artists are going to be big like two or three years out, and she, she'll have songs that are playing and she'll say that this person's going to be huge. And I've seen this like twenty or thirty times where the artist a few years later is is really big and if she could invest in those people, I mean, she'd, she'd be a multimillionaire by now, and, but there's no way to do it. And it would help the artist. It would help the users. It would, it would be really cool. But I think largely like U S securities regulation uh, is going to prevent that. So I, I don't imagine that's an innovation that will happen in the U S but it absolutely will happen somewhere in the world. I, I feel like, you know, a, a, maybe a year or two ago, people were sort of trying to experiment with this using things like counterparty or mm-hmm. yeah, mostly counterparty, I guess. Um, but what remains complicated is like anything in cryptocurrencies, you, you have friction between the sort of fiat world and the cryptocurrency world. Cause you need, you, you, I would assume you would need cryptocurrency to buy those types of tokens. So, or, or not. I mean, imagine if, uh, if the artist has a, a concert and can just get, give away or sell, you know, cards, to represent stakes in, in that person. Mm. Um, the friction at the, at the start doesn't need to be anything significant. You can imagine them selling, you know, the, the Taylor Swift shares for, for $10 a piece. And that can be done in fiat at a, at a concert, the, the double spend risk of a fan, you know, acquiring a share before it's worth a lot, um, is I think, uh, low enough that it would be completely doable. But yeah, I think you're right, Sebastian, that there was uh, quite a few things around that, exploring that. I think Swarm was was going in that direction as well. And, and then with Adam Levine, some of the ideas there. Uh, but it's a, it's a I, I totally agree with you that it's a huge potential problem, but it's also kind of a, a, a lot of things have to come together. User experience is going to be a massive issue besides, uh, mm-hmm. besides the regulations, for sure. Right. And, and the... Uh... The big case of this, this goes back to the whole crowdfunding phenomenon, which has gotten big. And, and it's, it almost goes against economic theory when, when like people wouldn't contribute or invest in an early stage company, but they would simply donate to it. it it's strange because in one, you, you may get a big return and in the other, you, you won't get any return. But the, the better way to think of it is you're getting a, a certain return in, in sentiment or in goodwill or something. But uh, with the Oculus, um, everyone remembers it was like one of the first big crowdfunding successes. And all these people contributed money to that project. And they got like a t-shirt or maybe a free Oculus out of it. And Oculus went on to become acquired by Facebook for for like billions of dollars. Um, None of that money went to any of the people who originally contributed in the crowdfunding campaign. Um, I think that I think that's terrible. I mean, I, I think those early backers should have should have made huge returns on that contribution, but largely because of securities rules, uh, the company can't offer you potential returns. They can only offer you zero returns. That's essentially what the regulation has has mandated. So, um, crowdfunding in general, that whole industry is is growing really fast, and I think if it could be uh, tokenized and people could get an actual share of, of the future revenue of something in an easy frictionless way, not something where you're signing investment documents, um, you know, and, and hiring a lawyer to do due diligence. But just if you have $20 and you like a project, you should be able to turn that $20 into $100 if two years later that project was a success. It seems like something that's very possible now with with frictionless payments. But again, not, not in the US. Yeah, absolutely. 
So uh, another interesting question about um, kind of your perspectives and views on on the ecosystem, Bitcoin, blockchain. Do you feel like there are some things that people aren't seeing clearly today and, and kind of people have the wrong convictions and beliefs in the industry? The biggest area where people have wrong convictions is in, in, uh, is in vilifying each other and on turning many opinions in the Bitcoin community into like a red team, blue team. Uh, polarization type thing, the block size debate being the biggest example of this. Um, and it's been it's been really discouraging to see it because at, at this point it's gotten to the extent that like uh, I, I was pretty disappointed with how, for example, Gavin was removed from the, his, his comment access um, due to the whole Satoshi thing. Um, <laughs> and I because basically the, the reasoning for removing him was that they thought he had been hacked. Uh, and he, within a couple hours, came out and said he had not been hacked. So what should have happened is the commit access was was granted again, and that should have been the end of it, regardless of what one thinks about him or Satoshi or anything. And so I made that point, and, and suddenly everyone starts thinking that, A, um, I I must think, I must be on the bandwagon that Craig Wright was Satoshi, uh, and B, that I'm against core developers because I'm saying something in defense of, of Gavin on one specific point in one case. And so you, you, it almost like stifles all sorts of opinion because you, you can't say anything without the community, um, the community pigeon holding you into a, a certain one team or the other. And, and it's gotten so ridiculous because I've, I have classic supporters that think I'm just a shill for core and I have core supporters who think I'm a shill for classic and it's all a bunch of nonsense. And I wish the community would realize that like the real enemies are still very much out there in a the traditional financial world. And uh, it'd be really nice if, people would stop vilifying each other who are all essentially other core Bitcoiners. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, uh, and I think that's been uh, a really sad thing to see how that's developed and just gotten worse and worse and worse. Do you think there is some hope here or do you see any way of that getting better? I don't know. It's probably a a psychological or, or sociological phenomenon. It's the same reason that in the US you have Democrats and Republicans and they are largely the same in how in how they view government and what they think government should be doing. The, the amount of difference they have is actually quite small between them. And yet each side thinks that the other is just the, the devil incarnate, um, totally horrible. And they don't, it's, it gets to the point where they don't debate um, policies or, or philosophy of politics and the role of government. They talk about uh, silly, superficial things that that are, are the easiest way of vilifying each other and confirming their own suspicions that the other is the enemy. And and I, I, I guess it's just a human phenomenon. Um, and so if if so, I don't I don't really think it can be fixed. But it's probably incumbent on each person to just try to not let themselves fall into the false narrative that someone who disagrees with you is automatically an enemy and is automatically has bad intentions um, and all and all that kind of and all that kind of thing. Right. And and I certainly agree with you. I think if one looks at the US, then it seems pretty clear that also we have seen a, a complete disintegration of uh, dialogue and discourse, etc. But the implications are interesting. You know, if you look at something like Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in general, which are these projects managed by a community, a little bit like a government or a nation in a way. So if, if, if that's kind of the natural course, of how these projects evolve that what would that mean there is an important difference which is that uh, anyone who's part of a country is is essentially stuck in that country and with that government as a citizen the the friction to change your your tax farm is very high whereas in the in the bitcoin and software open source world um it, it is really true that uh that you can work on a different project if you if you want and 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 leave and it's it, there's no capture there so um, I think it allows in a much smaller time frame for um, a good feedback effect where if if the group is really going in the wrong direction uh, people will move on to something else and and that's it's an important lesson because there are a number of people in I think the Bitcoin community who believe, Bitcoin is the only way that you can do digital currency. It is the best. It will forever be the best, not because of its specific merits, but just because that's the flag they wave. 
And so they dismiss anyone who's trying to point out like concerns or, or possible problems. Um, and if people become entrenched in that opinion, then uh, you really do run the project off, off the rails and much of the community moves on to something else. And then all those, all those people are going to wake up someday and, and say, well, what, what the hell happened? Why did this fail? And it's because they, they became isolated and, and didn't, um, didn't try to listen to what other people were doing. And, and all those times they told them, well, if you don't like it, just leave. They, they actually just left. That's what yeah. I don't want to see happen with Bitcoin. Yeah, I agree. I mean, one of my points of view has been, and, and this is probably something that couldn't have been done when Bitcoin was created, right? Because Bitcoin was like complex enough, so you couldn't really find solutions for these problems that would arise like six years later, seven years later, etc. But I almost feel like you would need an explicit governance system where people could kind of vote on protocol changes and things like that. Because even even though the the friction to maybe leave bitcoins and go somewhere else is not that big it depends though right if you have a business built on it it's very big and switching to a different version of the software is actually also quite difficult right because you so so there is a huge kind of intrinsic thing where like you know core has by being the default choice that it makes it actually really hard yeah there is there is friction, uh, but it's important not to overestimate that friction. It's important not to assume that just because Bitcoin is the biggest and most important blockchain asset now, that it will forever be. It it may be, but it's not going to be because it is now. It's going to be because it continues to become. It continues to to grow um, as the market needs it to grow. If it doesn't if it doesn't move along with how the what the market needs, then it, it will start to become marginalized. Um, and so it's, it's important to be humble and realize that like Bitcoin is not perfect. It should always, people that are involved in it should always be listening and talking and just being polite to each other and trying to figure out, you know, a good way to move the project forward without becoming hostile and, and isolated. Cause that's a really good recipe for the project to become the project to die. I mean, it's not going to die because of a government. It's going to be die. It's going to die because the community itself, uh, poisons itself with, with, um, bad, bad attitudes and bad behaviors toward each other. The, the real value of Bitcoin is the community behind it. And so if that gets sick, the, the technology won't be long behind. Yeah, but I mean, the government's behind all this, you know, the block size debate, that's all. <laughs> uh, no, but like, uh, so, you know, that's all good and everything. And I think we can all agree that, you know, we need to be nice to each other and be humble. But, you know, pragmatically, what do you feel where where do you feel you know government needs to go to like in what direction do we need to go in order to have you know proper governance around bitcoin if we want this to continue you know to grow as a as a network i'm i'm not sure um i'm not a i'm not an expert on on the best way to govern uh large groups and especially open source groups um there are probably people in the open source software world who have some good opinions on that kind of thing but uh, unfortunately, I, I don't know. So one one last brief topic. You got involved in Bitcoin, I think, partially also from uh, the, the um, coming from a libertarian background. And it's pretty obvious to people, I think, the, the connection between liberty, you know, choice, having kind of, you know, control of your money and and Bitcoin, right? What do you see as the connection between maybe the larger concept of blockchain and liberty and libertarianism? Do you see a strong connection there as well? Well, the the most fundamental connection is that like one of the one of the biggest and worst powers that states currently have is is the ability to create and control money. Um, and money is such a large part of everyone's life that that the fact that that sits within the seat of government is um uh, is really dangerous. And so like my blog is called money and state. And I, I often frame it as a, as I frame Bitcoin as, as the separation of, of money and state in the same way that, that the church and state were separated and everyone today understands why that was so important and agrees that it was good that that happened. And yet we give an even more important institution, which is money, uh, over to the government. So Bitcoin is proving that free market money can work. It's proving, uh, the innovation, um, 
the what I mean, one of the coolest things to see is that the the security and consumer protection that is getting built, not by regulation, but by companies in this industry building products to serve consumers. And uh, Shapeshift is is an example of that. So we we don't hold customer money and we don't take customer information. And uh, when we got hacked, we didn't lose customer information and we didn't lose customer money. So we protected both people's finances and their uh, their personal identity. And this is something that none of the regulations seem to appreciate, is that that uh, the goals of regulation, which are often noble, which are protecting people and preventing crime, you know, actual crime, um, those things can be done without government being involved. Those things are, are can can spontaneously emerge out of market processes. And it's a little new, it's a nuanced argument that a lot of people don't appreciate because they always want this sort of top-down leader. But the blockchain industry in general, I think, demonstrates that Without a top-down leader, order can still happen. Innovation happens uh, much faster. The system is much more resilient and flexible. And ultimately, uh, it's it's more just. Paul, thanks so much. No, and I, I think that's a, that's a great note to end on. And, and I'm certainly very excited to see where this all leads and what this world will look like, because I think it will look quite radically different with all these different projects and to see it kind of roll the evolving role the little blue shapeshift fox is going to take on and, and where on all the places where it's going <laughs> to jump out at you in the future well thank, thanks a lot for having me on the show today guys yeah thanks so much and and just one last thing so if, if you look at eric I, I, we do want to point out that in the background there there is the bear whale when i, I saw that when he just went to the bathroom before and i was like i, I know that one which, uh, <laughs> if if you are, if you're curious about that, uh, just Google bear whale and and it, it was quite a hilarious story. I think we'll put that. <laughs> Who's the artist uh, who who made that? Um, the last name is is Hibel. So uh, after the bear whale thing, Shapeshift um, basically put out a, a bounty to see if some artists would. We wanted to commission some like artwork for the bear whale and the slaying of the bear whale back in fall of 2014. Um, and we selected two of the, two of the best ones, and, and this was one of them. I think Matt Hable is the guy's name. Um, but if you go to shapeshift.io slash bearwhale.html, the, the whole story is there, plus the other artwork. And there were so many great artists that, that were also making bear whale artwork. That's definitely one of the best parts of the community is, is just all the, all the jokes that people have with each other and the, the funny things that, that get built on top of it. The bear whale is, I think, going to be a, a symbol in Bitcoin forever. Just like the just like the uh, honey badger, and the alpaca. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and of course, Dorian's lunch today as well. Yeah, and Dorian, Dorian himself. I mean, he, he will yeah. forever be a, a symbol for the community. Okay, well, Eric, thanks so much for coming on. It was a pleasure uh, finally meeting you uh, like this, uh, as opposed to via email and uh, talking about Shapeshift. I mean, it's a it's a really exciting project, and we we are you know excited to see what the company will accomplish over the next few years yeah glad, glad to be on the show and thank you guys for doing the show it's it's definitely something i try to listen to all the time you guys have been putting out great content for years now so keep up the good work thank you and yeah it's great to meet you as well it was actually this is the first time we've actually spoken i think because even before like when we were setting up the sponsorship with uh shapeshift like way back when you guys weren't even sort of it, it wasn't even public that you were the CEO mm -hmm. and oh, you were yeah, going to right. or put... something like that. Yeah. And we were I was talking under with my, Emily. my alter ego. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, we've just been, been, been uh, working with your team. So I mean, we never actually got to speak. So, but yeah. Yeah. That's, that's totally true. I forgot that we were like, uh, <laughs> that there was some fake name. What, what was it again? Bjorn. Bjorn, Bjorn. is a, a, a character in Lord of the Rings. He's the shapeshifter. <laughs> oh yeah yeah all right well thanks so much and thanks so much for listeners so we're part of the let's talk bitcoin network you can find uh, our show and lots of other shows on let's talk bitcoin.com and of course you can also subscribe to it in any podcast app or watch the videos on youtube.com slash epicenter bitcoin and if you'd like to you can uh, leave us a review and then email us at show at epicenter bitcoin.com and we'll send you a t-shirt so uh, thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.